Welcome to another spirit-filled message on Christocentric message. If you're new to this channel, I would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video. As well, I would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth, it's going to bless you. Your graces are going to be imparted onto you and then God is going to visit your home. Thank you for watching. Stay blessed. Every time light seems to fade, the problem is not the light. The problem is the object reflecting it. So there are times on earth where the nighttime looks very dark. It is simply the problem of the alignment of the moon, not the illumination of the sun. As for the sun, it remains ever bright. And the Bible says the path of the just is as a shining light. Is that in your Bible? That shineth more and more. More and more is the destiny of every believer in Christ even unto the perfect day. May you find light tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. It takes light to rule. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Once that lamp is lit, it is impossible to hide it. Hallelujah. And so it's important for you to be very intentional about your receiving the word of God. Don't be careless about it at all. Jesus gave a parable and it was the parable of the sower. And he said that a sower came and sowed good seed, but on four different kinds of soils. Are we together? And they produce several kinds of harvest for even the soils that were good. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. That means it is the responsibility of every believer to open up your heart because the Bible tells us how to be a good soil. It says the one that fell on good soil are they that heard the word and understood it. So your hearing and your understanding is what makes you a good soil. Praise the name of the Lord. Tonight, I want to teach on a topic that I believe is going to speak to so many of us. I believe that this topic will give us wisdom, will give us intelligence, will mature our understanding as to the ways of God and will help us to be able to command greater levels of victory because this is the assignment of the teaching priest. According to Jeremiah 3 and verse 15, it says, and I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. It says they will feed you with knowledge and they will feed you with understanding. It says, and that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. Hallelujah. So when the word of God is taught, it helps you to understand the ways of God and it fades away ignorance from your Christian experience. In the presence of light, you can now walk in dominion. Hallelujah. Dominion is not a possibility outside of light. It takes light to dominate. Psalm, I mean Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 1. It says, arise, shine. Not because you are tired of sitting down. It says, for your light is come. Amplified will say, arise from the depression and the prostration that circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm teaching tonight on a topic that I title, The Afflictions of the Righteous. And I want you to please pay attention. You would be learning a lot tonight. The Afflictions of the Righteous. Psalm 34 and verse 19. Help us, Spirit of the living God. We depend on your wisdom. The Bible says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Then it says, But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Two very powerful information. Number one, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And then number two, it says, the Lord delivered him out of them all. Say amen. amen. Second scripture, please. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans 8, 28. The Bible says, and we know, this is an information that is privy only to believers. It is not general knowledge. It says, and we know, we who are of the fold, we who are 
people who have submitted to the word he said there is an information we know that gives us the staying power through negative seasons he says and we know that all things work together for good not to everybody to them that love god to them that are called according to his purpose can we look at one more scripture second corinthians chapter 4 please 17 and 18 second corinthians chapter 4 17 and 18 here's what paul says for our light affliction which is but for a moment he says walketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory 18 says while we look not at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen he says for the things which are seen are temporal subject to change but the things which are not seen are eternal may the lord bless the reading of his word hallelujah now to start tonight the bible teaches us that we have been called as believers into a life of victory that for the believer there is a very definite implication when you give your life to Jesus Christ as we know you receive of his life and you surrender your life to him the Bible tells us number one that there is a translation from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son number two the bible tells us that you become the righteousness of god in christ because now you have access through christ to that gift of righteousness are we together then the bible tells us according to john chapter 10 and verse 10 that for believing in jesus you have access to that life I am come that ye may have life and that you may have that life more abundantly Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and when we get to verse 16 he says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life the Greek word zoe 17 says for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world it says but that the world through him might be saved so there are many implications um, to being a believer when you become a believer you are not an ordinary person among other things the Bible tells us that you are the righteous are we together you are a bona fide recipient of the life of God you now sustain the potential to walk in victory first Corinthians 15 and verse 57 the Bible says now thanks be to God first Corinthians 15 and 57 5 7 thanks be to God which giveth us the victory and that that victory comes through our Lord Jesus Christ so it's important for us to know that the Bible teaches in a very clear and unmistaking way that believers are called to a life of victory you must have that at the back of your mind number two is that the basis for the believers victory in the kingdom is the finished work of Christ you must be able to defend your confidence as to the fact that you should live a victorious life because situations and circumstances will challenge that victory the basis for the believers victory in the kingdom is the finished work of Christ that means the summation of everything Jesus did from his death his burial and his resurrection this is the basis listen as simple as this point is if you do not know what is the basis for your victory you will just become a religious person who is speaking what seems to be right but it does not sustain any power in the spirit because the anointing is released on the strength of understanding 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 it is not what you say or do that releases power it is the understanding that supports what you say or what you do so this is a kingdom that is predicated upon understanding the spirituality and the correctness of your activity notwithstanding that means you can act correctly you can even speak correctly but from a standpoint of ignorance it will not produce any results are we together the sons of Sceva were saying the correct thing we adjure you by Jesus the statement was correct but the requisite understanding that will release the power to back what they were saying was not there so it is not just what we do 
in terms of its correctness. It is the spiritual understanding that supports our speakings and our doings that releases the power of God. Ephesians 4.18 says, having their understanding darkened. It says, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. In fact, the assignment of the prince of this world, as Paul taught us, is to blind the minds of the people. Are we together now? So the Bible teaches that we have been called unto a life of victory in Christ. And the Bible teaches us that the singular basis for the believer's victory is on the strength of that which Christ has done. Of course, in partnership with our understanding and our acting upon that truth, even in faith. Are we following so far? The third point I want us to know as a foundation tonight is that the Bible is also very clear as to the fact that there will be moments of affliction. Listen now. Having established the fact that the word of God is clear as to the believer's heritage and destiny of perpetual victory. And the Bible tells us that the basis for our victory is Christ and that which he has done. Are we together? But the Bible also is not silent as to the fact that believers will face moments of afflictions, losses, pain, and challenges. You would think the Bible should be silent about these issues, but the Bible is very clear as to the fact that there will be moments of afflictions, there will be moments of losses, there will be moments of pain and challenges in the life of the believer. Psalm 20, please, from verse 1 to 5. The psalmist wrote it so beautifully. He said, the Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. So the psalmist identifies such a moment in the life of the believer called the day of trouble. This was not negative confession. He's saying in my study, even as a king, I have come to a point where there are time periods in the lives of men, even those who are of the fold, even the covenant people, that there is such a day called the day Day of trouble it says the name of the God of Jacob defend thee verse 2 send thee help in that day of trouble from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion verse 3 it says remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt offerings we're reading to 5 verse 4 grant thee according to thine own heart to fulfill all thy counsel the last verse it says we will rejoice in thy salvation and in the name of our God will we set up our banners it says the Lord will fulfill all our petitions so the psalmist is saying that there is a day called the day of trouble hallelujah several examples we can find in scripture of men and women who were purported to be righteous and yet had moments and seasons of very very disheartening conditions an example was as we find in scripture an example is abraham and sarah in genesis chapter 15 from verse 1 to 3 the bible tells us that after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram. He says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Can you imagine this kind of salutation? And yet Abraham was in the midst of something that was a serious problem. Verse 2, it says, And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is the Eliezer of Damascus, verse 3. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is my heir. Do you know what he was saying? Thank God for all these wonderful salutations, but I'm in the middle of a situation. This is what matters to me right now. I go childless. In fact, when you read chapter 16 and verse 1, give us 16 verse 1. The Bible tells us now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bear him no children. Can you imagine that this, this is Abraham that the Bible would call the friend of God. This is Sarai, his wife. And yet, even as people who were so close to God, they had such an issue in their life, trusting God for the fruit of the womb. 
And the Bible is not silent about that story. You would think the Bible would just wrap it up and say Abraham was a great man, came from Ur of the Chaldeans, was a noble man, received a promise from God, finally offered Isaac and became a great man. That's an intelligent way to summarize the Bible. But the Bible goes to be that detail to tell us the concerns of that man Abraham. Are we together? Example number two. Israel in the land of Egypt the Bible records that Israel God's own chosen people his covenant people were in captivity you find that in Exodus chapter 1 um, the full text is 1 to 14 but let's jump to verse 8 for the sake of time hallelujah is someone learning already that the nation of Israel, God's covenant people, were in captivity. And did you know for all that 430 years, God still called them my people and they still identified him as their God. And yet, they were in captivity. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Verse 9. It says, and he said unto his people, behold, I hope you know that the captivity of the nation of Israel started as a plan to manage fear and jealousy. That was what led, graduated to become 430 years of captivity. Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also our enemies and fight us. That was the whole basis for subjugating them. There was a time they were equal in terms of ranking and privileges. But another king came up and said, no, we can't let this happen. One day they will become allies with our enemies and they will defeat us. And so they suggested captivity and bondage as a strategy to keep them limited. Are we together now? And verse 11 now for time. The Bible says, therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramesses. These were gods in Egypt. And you read down to 14, it just tells you the captivity that God's own people went through. How will you imagine that God, who is the mighty God, is watching from heaven and not for two years, not for 10 years. This is the longest time officially recorded that God's people went into captivity consciously under their taskmasters. Hallelujah. Example number three is the mysterious story of Job. We find that in chapter one down to chapter two. Just write it for reference. Up till this day, it has remained a theological debate as to the, the real spiritual lesson behind the story of Job because it takes extreme level of spiritual intelligence, discernment, work with God to be able to decipher the book of Job is, is laced with all kinds of confusion. It starts by telling us of a noble man, the greatest and the wisest as his time in the East. And the Bible records that he was a man that feared the Lord and eschewed evil. Qualified to be called a righteous man by the standard, whatever standard was there. Now the Bible tells us that there was a summon in the heavenlies. This is where the story gets very interesting. And that Satan was also there. The Bible never called him Lucifer. At this time, it identifies him already as Satan. This is a very disturbing scripture. Because when you read from the banishing of Satan from heaven, the Bible says a place was no longer found for him in heaven. And yet the Bible says Satan came among them. So this can be an endless debate among theologians. That's not our goal tonight. I'm just showing you that there is such a disturbing reality and you find it in the Bible. Are we together now? And then a discussion happens in heaven and based on the text, Satan is given permission to touch everything around Job except his life. Then the Bible says that there was a day on earth can you see that the manifestation of affliction and all kinds of evil also work with times? There was a day on earth for the execution 
of that which was finished in the spirit. And the Bible says, one report after report, the sons, his cattle, all kinds of things happened to that man. But I love something that the Bible says happened to Job. It says that with all of these things that Job bowed his head and worshipped. What an, what an interesting, what an interesting expression. Do you know what it means that in one day you lose your daughters, you lose your sons, you lose your business, you lose everything. And the Bible says he shaved himself, he fell down and worshipped. Example number four, are we learning? The Bible talks about a wonderful woman in scripture called Ruth. You find that in Ruth chapter one and we we'll read from verse 1 to 5. Now, there are two women who had the privilege of their names as books of the Bible. One is Esther, the other is Ruth. Hallelujah. The Bible says it came to pass in the days when judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife had two sons. He's talking about Naomi now. The Bible says his name was Elimelech and then the wife was Naomi. And then they had two sons, Malon and Chilion. And they got married to Ruth and to Oprah. Are we together? Just rushing for sake of time. Let's go to verse 4 for the sake of time. We're reading to 5. The Bible says they took them wives of the women of Moab and one was called Oprah and the other was called Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Watch affliction. Watch tragedy. The Bible says the two sons also died. I don't know what kind of spirit was walking there but the husband of Naomi died and then the sons that got married to them also died the bible says and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband separated from them and you know the story that looked like the end of Ruth's life in fact the woman told them when you read the full text he said look go and find husbands for yourself just leave me i'm a woman with many sorrows and then oprah went and ruth refused and that led to a series of events that will finally connect her to boaz and now you know from history that she was part of the genealogy of Jesus. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Are we learning? It says, but the Lord delivered him from them all. Still giving examples. Example number five. Jesus himself. You would think because he's the son of the living God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he would be exempted from affliction. When you read from Luke chapter 22, all through, for sake of time, you just write it. The Bible tells us that Jesus himself got to a point where he had to stand before Pontius Pilate. In fact, right from Gethsemane, he looked at the people when they came with swords and all of that. He said, why are you using knives to come and catch me? I was all around with you in the temple. What offense have I committed? But this is your hour and the power of darkness, he said. Am I right on that? And Jesus was caught malhandled in you know with the council Pontius Pilate and you know the story went through all kinds of things until he died even the death on the cross the cross is a very interesting place I have taught you the cross is the place where both good and bad people meet there were three crosses there at Golgotha and there were three men there one among them was Jesus and the other were thieves. So be careful who you talk about on the cross. You might be talking about Jesus. The cross is a mysterious place like the prison where both good and bad people are. Hallelujah. Jesus. Number six, giving you examples from scripture. The Bible talks about Peter, the early apostles. Now, Peter in Acts chapter 12 from verse 1 to 4, know the story. That's the story of Peter. The Bible says, Herod stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, reading to verse 4. It says, verse 2, and he killed James. Can you imagine? James, the brother of John with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And verse 4, the Bible says that he apprehended Peter and he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him intending that after Easter he would bring him forth to the people. You would think a great apostle who just preached 
Peter preached the official sermon to launch the manifestation of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How will a man filled with the Holy Spirit, mentored directly by Jesus, received, they were the first fruits of the ministry that ushered in the dispensation of the Spirit. And yet, this man was now bound as a criminal, kept in prison. Hallelujah. Do I talk about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16? That these men, the Bible says that they went to preach and they found a certain damsel who was possessed by the spirit of divination. And by the authority of the spirit, they casted that demon out. And then the Bible tells us that as a result, they will lay them, they flog them and put them in prison. You can imagine Paul and Silas in prison, bound, hand and feet. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered them from them all. Now, please listen carefully. I wrote something down here. I said, believers must be trained to know and respond to these periods of affliction and challenges. Believers must be trained because you see, we live in a world where because of the loud proposition of our victory in Christ, most believers are at a loss when they begin to face moments where they cannot understand what is happening around their lives, their families, and many believers have turned away from the things of God because of the negative situations and circumstances around them, their lives. Because they've tried to find meaning and perspective as to why some of these things, I understand the affliction of the sinner, the Bible says, mark the wicked, their end is destruction. So I don't need to ask why the wicked is being punished. I don't need to ask why the wicked is being destroyed. But the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. The destruction of the sinner is imminent. Based on God's justice system and based on the laws of the spirit. Because the Bible says that... Um, how does he put it now? It says, good understanding procured favor. That is um, Proverbs 13, 15. It says, but the way of the transgressor is hard. The transgressor is the violator of God's principles. So when people violate principles and become wicked, their end is already predicted from scripture. Now, but how do you reconcile the righteous seeming to go through the same experience as the wicked? In the face of challenges, what then is the excellency of righteousness? What then is the excellency of godliness? By reason of what I do, almost on a daily basis without exaggeration, I receive calls and text messages from people, many of them believers, seeking explanation, communicating their various annoyance and lamentations as to many things that may have befallen them from bereavements, there are people who have lost loved ones and some of the loved ones at the point of death, they were saying by his stripes, I am healed. And yet they still died. How do you explain that to an unbeliever? How do you explain people who got into all kinds of trouble because they refused to give bribe or collect bribe? They stood for their integrity and made up their minds that they would not compromise. And you would think their refusal, you know, their, their, their rejecting compromise should immediately bring them to elevated positions of honor. Many of them went through declines, sadly, even unto death. How about Matthiadom? Those who stood for Jesus, even at the point of death. Hallelujah. How about believers who have trusted releasing their hearts, releasing their all? How about believers who emptied their accounts, serving the purposes of the kingdom? And there seemed to have been a boomerang effect that has affected them when the pandemic struck. It, it hit believers, it hit unbelievers alike. And let me tell you the truth. If explanation and perspective is not given to this, we are going to lose many believers in the days that come because many people will be confused. I understand the affliction of the wicked, but it is difficult to understand the affliction of the righteous. Hallelujah. As a man of God, I have seen miracles, all kinds of manifestations of God's power, 
and I'm indebted to God eternally for trusting us with this grace and apostleship to do the things we have done. But I have had to stand and weep with people at their funerals. I've had to comfort families. I've also had to, you know, just keep quiet and give God the glory because in, in spite of the spiritual intelligence and the grace given, we have been confronted even as men of God with situations where it is wisest to just be silent because any other thing you say will be a communication of foolishness in light of that kind of catastrophe. There are times that believers are so plagued with certain situations that the best way, the best way is just to say, Lord, we thank you. We may not understand, but we thank you. Hallelujah. I have studied this myself and by the Spirit of God, I have come up with five keys. And this is really the core of my teaching tonight. I want you to please pay attention. I guarantee you that you will need this teaching in your life and with it you'll be able to help others. And if you're a man of God here, please lend me your attention because you will be confronted with situations that will require this level of spiritual understanding. There are five keys that are found from Scripture that is able to help the righteous to not only manage afflictions but to turn that affliction to victory even in the spirit you see we agree from scripture that challenges are not unusual in fact here's what jesus said in this world you will have tribulation jesus is speaking he says but be of good cheer for i have overcome the world this is not a prophet this is not some apostle this is jesus the christ himself saying in this world there is a guarantee that you will have this and that tribulation he says but be of good cheer i have overcome the world hallelujah there are five biblical keys that the Bible gives the believer as the keys that will help them to experience victory in spite of or in the midst of challenges. Are you ready for the five keys? Pray in the spirit for one minute and ask the Lord to open your understanding. Give us understanding even by your word. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, the righteous businessman, the righteous apostle, the righteous prophet, the righteous mother, the righteous student, the righteous politician, even the righteous nation. Hallelujah. Key number one. Key number one. Are you ready? The first key that the Bible gives, now you must understand that the word of God is not a recommendation that the word of God is not an opinion. It may look like a recommendation, it may look like an opinion, but for the believer who wants to walk perpetually in victory, the word of God is life, the word of God is instruction. It says, my son, pay attention to my words, incline your ears to my sayings. It says, do not let them depart from your heart, keep them in the midst of your, your, your mouth, keep them in the midst of your heart. He said, they are life, not to everybody, to those that find them and health, even to their flesh. So you must take the word of God as final authority, as touching anything. The word of God presents the mind of God concerning any and all matters. Are we together? Number one, the first key any believer, any righteous person who is going through a season of affliction, doesn't matter what it is called, the first recommendation from scripture is to look unto Jesus. Please write. As simple as that sounds, do not assume you understand what I'm saying. Just write and listen. To look unto Jesus. To look unto Jesus. Now we can read Psalm 34, beginning from verse 1. Look on to Jesus. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Verse 2. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of and hear thereof and be glad. Verse 3. It says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. For I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Five, it says they looked unto him. Is that in your Bible? And they were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Verse six, 
it says the poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles reading to 10 the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them verse 8 it says oh taste and see that the Lord is good blessed is the man that trusted in him Verse 9, O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Final verse, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger. It says, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Say loud, amen. amen. Hallelujah. So the Bible says to look unto Jesus. You find that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, he says, the author and the finisher of our faith. Please look up. I can tell you it is very difficult to look unto Jesus in the face of challenges, tribulations. What does it mean to look? Now pay attention. To look means to direct one's gaze and focus towards someone or something. That's what it means to look. To look means to direct one's gaze, to direct one's focus away from other things towards someone or towards something. But then to look also means to rely on or to depend totally upon. When the Bible says look unto Jesus, Number one, it means to set your gaze upon him, not wavering whatsoever. But number two, it means to depend and rely totally upon him. Even when you do not understand him, look unto Jesus. The biblical recommendation for managing seasons and moments of affliction. Look unto Jesus, the Bible says. There is a very strange and interesting story. You find that in Numbers chapter 21 from verse 4 down to 9. The Bible talks about the nation of Israel that when they came by the way of the Red Sea, the Bible says to compass the land of Edom. The soul of the people was discouraged because they kept walking endlessly and it looked like there was no victory, no rest for them. They were hungry, they were angry, and the trouble started from verse 5. Reading to verse 9, the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, there is no water, and our soul loathed this light bread. Verse 6, the Bible says the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they beat the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. He says, pray unto the Lord that he takes away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. How did God answer the prayer? The Lord instructed Moses and said, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is beaten when he looketh upon it shall leave. What kind of an instruction is that? What is the relationship between a serpent, a brazen serpent, and healing, and life, and victory? It was not about the serpent. He was teaching them that there is life and dominion in trusting God's plan, in trusting God's way. As foolish as it is, once it is God that has spoken, he's saying even in the midst of the fiery serpents, the wisest thing to do in front of a snake is to run away, not to look. Hallelujah. It is stupid for someone to sit down and watch a serpent curl around you. Are we together now? And it's about to kill you. The wisest human instruction is to run away, not to look at some serpent somewhere. And yet, that is the foolishness of God's path. He was teaching them that the ways of God may not make sense, but in them there is life. Hello, beloved in Christ. We hope this message was a blessing to you. I would want you to do something for us. If you are new here, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this video as well. Share to your family and friends to bless them because we know that this message will be a blessing to their body, to their soul, and to their spirit. We would need you to do one thing for us too. 
tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from. And if you've got any testimony for us, kindly share with us. Thank you for watching.